open a meeting for me, I've got to read my, my script, okay? Might take a few minutes, okay? Right, so first of all, please don't make any recordings until I, as chair, declare the meeting open. Uh, fire alarm, in the event that the fire alarm sounds, please make your way to the nearest fire exit and follow the instructions of officers and fire marshals. And the assembly point is across the car park. Uh, no smoking. Uh, smoking is not permitted in Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority buildings. <coughs> you probably knew that anyway, but it's, it's on my strip. So, toilets are uh, located further along the corridor on the opposite side, with signs clearly marking each door. If you require the use of these facilities, please respect the conduct of business and return to the room without delay. Should you be requested to leave the meeting for any reason other than in an emergency, you will be required to switch off any recording equipment and leave the meeting with all your belongings. Privacy confidentiality. Request, I'm asking that anyone present who has any items relating to personal or private or confidential or exempt information, please ensure that the items are not on display until such time that they may be required. And I'm informing everybody present that proceedings of the meetings may be recorded. Is everyone happy with that? Yeah. And if any observers have any objections to being recorded, um, I'm giving you now the opportunity to leave the meeting. Nobody's left, so I presume everybody's happy. And could you please put your mobiles either <coughs> switch them off or put them on silent, please? Okay? Now, for those who don't know, it says here, I am Councillor, it's got a blank, but I remember my name, <laughs> Councillor Ryan. <laughs> and I'm chair of this meeting, and I now declare the meeting open. <coughs> So recordings may now commence. I feel like a film director here. Okay, right. So carrying on now. So the meeting's open. Um, apologies. I think I'm right in saying that we've only had apologies from councillors Brennan and Preston, and they're being replaced today by councillors Byron and Sullivan. So thanks right. to them for, for deputising. Are there any more apologies? No? Okay. Has any members got any declarations of interest to record no, no. in relation to the agenda. No? <coughs> okay. And I haven't been advised of any items of agency that need to go on the agenda. Is that, is that correct? Okay. And there are no matters requiring the exclusion of the press and public due to the disclosure of exempt information. Right. So if we move on now to the minutes of the last meeting, which was the meeting held on the 5th of February 2019. These are submitted for approval. Can they be approved, or has anybody got any, any amendments or queries on the minutes? Agreed. So they can be agreed? Okay, so you're happy for me to, to sign them? Right, thank you. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Now, we now move on to item number three. And I think at this point I hand over to the Chief Fire Officer to introduce the item. Page 11 and the limit. Thanks, Chair. This is a phase of the portrait, which I believe is quite positive in relation to the work that we're doing, particularly focused on our community activity. Uh, and the person of course is to inform members of the fund and we've been able to secure to support some of our activities in our community risk management during the, the 2018 period. And the recommendations specifically are that members note the, the £737,500 worth of funding was secured through partnership working to ensure that the community safety initiatives that were put in place across the side are effective in reducing down the levels of anti safe behaviour and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, detail within the report, it shows you the impact that that work has had within our communities. The report itself goes on to, kind of to, to capture the financial contributions that have been made by a number of partners across <coughs> all each and every one of the districts and then focuses on page 14 really which is probably in that particular area about the impact that that work has had so our financial support that we received alongside the, the commitments and the match funding from the Fire and Rescue Authority has resulted in us tackling some of the issues affecting us on a day-to-day -day basis and the, the uh, chart shows that delivered and social media small fires over that period, we've seen a three percent reduction, and that's particularly um, positive when you recall that 2018 was a particularly hot period for us. And uh, so, I'd say the small fires being uh, seen a reduction over that period is 
I'm positive in the United States to deliver a vehicle fighter, we've seen a 22% reduction over the same period since 2017 and 18 into 2018-19. Uh, the number of delivered drone fighters was equally reduced by 33% over that same period, and the number of you know, people killed and seriously injured as a result uh, by 12%. Again, all down to that collaborative uh, partnership work which has been supported and funded some of the activities that Mercy South Fire and Rescue Service and our staff have been involved in over the period. It ranges from a, a whole multitude of things that we've done from street intervention through to fire cadets and um, through to very targeted campaigns. Um, I'll probably pause at that point here to see if there's any further questions that members would like to ask. <coughs> okay. Anybody got any questions at this stage? Can I just ask a yeah. very, very quick one on, on that, the, the KSR. How do we know? Do, do we have, how, how do we do we get, get to the nitty gritty of whether the funding it is working and whether, the, whether it, it is working on, on, on how to separate the funding from the the, the, you know, the actual collaboration part of it? And I know obviously it, it, it's interlinked because a lot of a lot of the, the collaboration you need the, the extra fund to do it. But how, how do we get, get through that? It's too far away for us. And it's funny enough that that was. Any some of the questions posed by the inspectors in regards to the work that we do, to say, okay, so you do this work and how are you going to demonstrate the impact that you're having? So the kills and saves and injured are kind of a, a, a really partnership focused outcomes that we're seeking to, to affect. Now, not necessarily all of those things are directly attributable to Mercy Side Fire and Rescue Service and the interventions that we're putting in place. Some of them are down to engineering, some of them are down to the role that the police will have in prosecuting drivers and so on and so forth. And so what we seek to do, and, and we've got evidence which supports that which we presented to the inspectors, we were to hone in on the, the key areas of focus for the service. So a lot of our initiatives are targeting at younger drivers in, through the 16 and 25, who um, are just on the kind of first stages of, of learn, genuinely learning to drive, and certainly a higher level of kills and safety injuries were attributable to that particular group. Um, and our work extends to working with colleges, working with um, some of the kind of the, uh, in, the, in the community and, and, and the football clubs as well, recognising that that's where some of that initial risk taking behaviour starts. And so we focused in on, on what's the impact of our educational input against those particular categories of <coughs> And over that same period, albeit it's, it's not contained within the report, we're seeing the number of killed and safety injuries in that particular age group, that categorisation, reduce significantly too. And you know, arguably evidence in the fact that the work that we're doing around engagement and education is having an impact. But what I would say is that is only one contributory factor to the, the broader approach that's taken by the partnership. We've done an extensive amount of work now as Mercy South Fire and Rescue Authority on behalf of the, the, the partnership around utilisation of social media and getting key messages across about you know, how to drive safely. Um, and all of those things will, will have come, will culminated in the reduction in kills and safety of injuries, injuries, but more robust evaluation probably does need to follow. Okay, thanks, you. Okay. Thanks, anybody else? <coughs> I just think yeah, the John. officers should be commended <coughs> for, for, for going out and getting all this money and it's not easy yet, and if you've got it, I think we should commend them for what they do. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure everyone will agree. It's a very positive report. If you want to go look at the figures on page 14 to show that arson figures are down, all the other figures are down. So it's, I think it's very much a good news story. So. Okay, so on the actual recommendation on page 11, are members happy to agree the recommendation? It's in three parts, but can you agree it overall? Agree. Right, thank you very much. Right, we'll move on to agenda item 4 on page 17. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Again, uh, first of the report is to inform members of Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority of the <coughs> community use of our fire stations, particularly with regard to um, the utilisation of safe havens for people who are at threat <coughs> to utilise them as a, as a haven um, through which they would find support from the firefighters who are at that particular location. And members will recall we approved <coughs> uh, the utilisation of our stations in such a way and it was on the basis of Liverpool City Council as the first local authority to adopt it outside of London, the approach um, and that was on, as a result of 
a, a young man called Jimmy Mizzen being tragically killed <coughs> in London. That's Kelly's. Okay, Kelly. Okay. Right, uh, so, so members may well recall Jimmy Mizzen as a young man who went out to just go about his business um, and unfortunately at the time suffered horrific injuries which resulted in his death. The, the, the outcomes of that was there was a belief that there was no way that a particular young man could find haven um, and as a result of that his family actively engaged the kind of buzz in London and that the model of a safe haven. As a result of that that's what was, was instilled in London. Liverpool adopted that and then we subsequently taken that model and adopted it across all of our fire stations. Um, and you know, members will see from the report itself that you know, our stations have been used quite, you know, quite a number of times, about 18 reported activations of our, our safe haven alerts. Um, and at three stations, particularly Liverpool City, St. Helens, and Brutal and Nedden, you know, they've been you know, used at more than one occasion on a number of our other locations across Merseyside and deeply <coughs> members of the call during the civil disorder. Back in 2011, Birkenhead you know, Fire Station was also uh, utilised as a safe haven during that period. <coughs> so again, a really positive you know, approach that we've adopted endorses the role that the fire mission service has in safeguarding people who, you know, who live and work in our communities and the real focus and the key focus that the, the fire station is. So the purpose of the report and the recommendations are that members note the contents of the report, note that given the national local and regional priorities in respect to organised serious crime, the prevalence of, of knife and, and gun crime. Mayside Fire and Rescue Authority review the process and raise awareness around the safeguard, safeguard of young people through the safe havens and you know, maybe broaden that out against our community fire stations. And then we recognise that those vulnerabilities are often related to safeguard related matters and removing the, the responsibility to ensure the project functions as effectively it has done under the safeguard and manager. Um, and they, those are the recommendations, Chair, and I'm happy to take any further questions if uh, it's just stated. Okay, thanks. Any questions or comments? Yeah, no. just a comment to say yeah. it shows yeah. how much the fire service is valued in the community. Yeah. People yeah. trust firemen. Yeah. 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 It's great that they can be used. Yeah. <coughs> I think it's great that people instinctively feel that their local fire station is automatically a safe haven oh, yeah. for them to go to. And I think part of the recommendation is that we should raise awareness of that, perhaps to, to remind people yeah. that that's, that's part of the role of the fire. <coughs> so, okay, so you've had the recommendation on page 17. Everybody happy to agree that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. It's all good news so far. Mm -hmm. And I think hopefully that will continue with agenda item five. <laughs> yeah, in, indeed it will, yeah, I won't use the, the mic this time because I think it's going to be a bit of feedback. But, uh, the purpose of the report is to advise members of the installation of community public access defibrillators at a cost of £15,000, which is inclusive of purchasing 26 defibrillator cabinets and the hardware and connection to those defibrillator cabinets and those defibrillators to be sited near to the running call boxes on every one of our fire stations. So, in, in effect, I suppose what, what, what we are describing there, we've had defibrillators on our fire stations for, for a considerable amount of time normally being housed inside the building itself and being utilised to I don't know, for our gym usage of our firefighters and so on and so forth. And what this report describes is moving the, the defibrillator outside of the, the fire station and so it makes it allowable and accessible to the public. So if anyone within the community who knows, because they are clearly identifiable, um, that there's a, a, an issue with someone, of their family, someone in the community, they would be able to make their way to the fire station they would get in contact with our fire control. Fire control would then pass the keypad number to them. They would enter the keypad number. That would open the, open the door of the cabinet. They would then be able to take out the defibrillator. And those defibrillators are so simple to use these days that the individual would just make themselves out to the casualty. And then they would be able to follow the instructions which are provided verbally by the machine itself. And it won't and, and wouldn't shock anyone who had a a heartbeat and, a, and so on and so forth. It would only shock someone who was in cardiac arrest. Um, and as a result of that, the potential is clearly there for a life-saving intervention by a member of the public. Notwithstanding that fact, obviously our fire stations are staffed with firefighters who are trained and competent in the utilization of the defibrillator, but also the provision of first aid. So if indeed when seeking to actuate that, 
that would also or could also facilitate firefighter support and the um, the response in regard to that cardiac incident. And so what we are suggesting as part part of the recommendations is that we purchase and fit those public accessible defibrillators to outside of all of our fire stations. So not only based on the previous conversation around safe haven, our, our fire stations become safe havens for people, but they are also accessible locations for defibrillation. Um, and, you know, and, and whilst there is some cost associated with that, the cost associated with defibrillators would be absorbed by the authority anyway, because we have those defibrillators on stations as it was. This is more about the installation of the next day part of the building, so public can access them. The other part of that, part, part of our station planning process, as we move forward, you know, the firefighters on those stations will work with the local community around what to do in the event of and how to utilise the defibrillators. So not only will they be there, but we'll do a bit of training with the surrounding community so they know how to use them, <coughs> use them confidently uh, in respect of any, any particular incident that should require them. And Chair, I'm happy to stop at that point and take any questions. Okay. Thanks very much. Yep, Leslie. Just a comment, really. Um, just that I'm a great advocate of uh, community public access to defibrillators, and we would have done um, in, in Wirral um, through, through various funding with our local authority and partnering with, with North West Ambulance Service. But one thing I do bang on about everywhere I go is the training that we have here as members yeah. of how to use them, um, because I think as community representatives, it would be tragic if we didn't, you know, if we came across a situation where somebody was in need of one and yeah. we didn't know how to use it and it was it was extremely simple and I keep telling people in my own local authority that while councillors are having training on all sorts of issues, you know, practical experience and um, practical training on something like this, I think is far more important than some of the, you know, some of the training sessions that we do have really and we should be, you know, as a fire service, um, blowing our own shit. Okay, thanks. I never yeah. have to use it, but uh, if I do, I, um, I feel I would be more confident than if I hadn't had the training. So okay, you. thanks, Leslie. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, well, I, I sit here as somebody who I'm only sitting here because I was defibrillated, and maybe this is a reason to re reject reject this idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you've got to be very uh, in favour of this. Um, practically, we should do training to every single you know councillor within Merseyside because they're all in that zone. We're all a certain age, and you know one thing and another. And uh, it's the sort of thing that we could promote in our own councils, that we do this simple 15 minute training, but also um, we've been involved in our own ward and our own villages and things, um, getting the, the local pub to put an a ex external accessible defibrillator in, in a location. And it's been used? It's been used several times, and that's the, the, the point. I assume that, because sometimes the fire station isn't crew, the crew aren't there these days, uh, for a period of time while the engine's out or whatever, but the, 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 the box outside, you'll be able to phone up um, the ambulance service, they'll give you the code and you can, you'll be able to open it in a normal way. I was also thinking that, just in my mind, quite a lot of fire stations are quite close to highways and thoroughfares, but one or two, thinking of the new Prescott fire station, is set back a little bit. Could we maybe look at exactly where it is we're going to put the in certain those locations which are not quite so to the front, whether there's any problem, because you'd have to run a little power supply up and things, it may just not be practical, but could we just look at exactly where we're going to put these uh, to be as um, you know useful as possible? Yeah, and, and the, the location is, 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 is <coughs> within the plans anyway, but actually take on board you know, as Barnes comments, is to go adjacent to where the running call is. So on, on most of our fire, on all of our fire stations, if the fire crew aren't on, on site at that particular time when someone comes to the station, sometimes people knock on the door to tell you there's a fire rather than necessarily call you. There's like a yellow phone to come on and pick it up and you get directly straight through to our fire control. So the, the location of the box is next door to that phone so they can actually pick up, say I need access to the defibrillator box now and they would pass the code immediately pop the code in 
and then the view of the taken. And I, was, I think the visibility and the communication <coughs> is back twofold to the safe haven piece and, and just going out and re-communicating the fact that our fire stations are safe havens and then part part of this communication will be not only are they safe havens but they also have <coughs> accessible defibrillators at those locations too. People broadly know where their fire station is and they certainly know whether they're in close proximity to that so they will be able to go directly to, to that particular location, access the defibrillator and then take it to wherever they need it to go. Okay, thank you. Lynn? Yeah, uh, just to say yeah. that um, <coughs> obviously I think it's a terrific idea. We've got an external one. We've got four in Ainsdale Village, but we've got, only got one in the cabinet. Uh, most of the concerns are that you know it will be damaged in some way, antisocial behaviour. But I think it says on page 36, people are also concerned about any legal implications if they get it wrong, if they make it worse. Yes. You know, so I think that information out there that really they can't, you know, we're working with Network Rail now, they've got one at uh, Intel um, Railway Station, they're going to put an external cabinet uh, outside as well, but we also work with Steve Pang, yeah. and we've got the stickers, and they're great because they go in the shop windows yeah. and they say, well, the nearest one here yeah. is, yeah. so, so, you know, that's a good, uh, a good uh, point as well. Okay, thanks Lynn. Roy? Thank you, Chair. I'd, I'd just like to speak all three items together, because Literally, the expression that we hear of the town now is value for our books, I don't know be value for our pound, but literally, these three are classic examples of, of, of that. Um, we've always sold that prevention is better than cure, yet for years they wouldn't be able to argue again about can we measure this. Well, we've had two classic examples of, of being able to measure them and to show how it works, and then the, the other one at the back about the defibrillator, of course. Just one life is worth everything. Oh. And, and so, you know, and I know we have to in this day and age, and they're always measuring us against what this costs and what it, what it brings. Well, as I say, I think that's what I can say to the end. These are three classes, I think, fantastic examples of the great work that's being done. Uh, hopefully, it will continue to be done. And uh, I think, as Sharon said before, it's, it's got to thank everybody who not only put a lot of resources in, but also to make the best use of them. And, and hopefully that these uh, percentages keep dropping and then we can go, go forward. But again, I'd, I'd, I'd like to add my thanks to Shannon's, to everybody that's been part of this. It's, it's made such a, an impact upon, I think, Goal of Macy's Act. Hey, thanks, Yeah, had one statistic to take away. 80% of people who are resuscitated <coughs> die. 80% of people who are defibrillated live. And for the money, you're getting 26 for 15 grand. That's remarkable. Uh, that's a real discount. And think of the value 26 of these are doing for 15 grand when 80% of the people, if they ever have to use it, will still be walking around. Yeah. It's a great idea. The cost yeah. of a few more less than 15. Yeah, but well, the report confirms that the initial cost will be 15,000. I'm sure even you would agree that's good value for me. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, it's so seriously, I mean, people ask what, what price of life is yeah. 15,000 pounds or something like this. I think it's fantastic. Can I just ask a very quick one? Yeah. Because I'm ashamed to say that I, I, I wouldn't know how to use one of these. And I don't, well, that's, must, that's I must have missed point, it. Think, isn't it? Through, yeah. through the, yeah. But a week on. Will there be another occasion? Bearing in mind that we do have quite a high, we have had quite a high turnover of new members the last couple of years. Yeah. Look, I think I'll have a little look. Yeah, I'll yeah, hand over to the chief now. I think, it, make, I think it makes sense. After we take on some sort of a little bit of a refresher for kind of an initial training for, for members, and I know how well it's been received. The thing I would say, is, say in totality, firefighters, just the nature of the role, the training that they have, will only step forward. Right, and they only step forward because of the training that they've had and the confidence that they've got in utilising the, the piece of kit. Hence the reason why that community engagement, giving people the confidence to put, press the button on, the, on the, the box in the first instance and open it up and take it out. That's the harder step for someone to take because they, they freeze the, yeah. because of their lack of confidence in being able to utilise it. So the more we can do to ensure that people step forward at a point of crisis, the better. So, not only will we do that for the authority, we will also do that with the surrounding communities where they are more than likely to need to utilise that box and the defibrillator at some point in time. So, yes. could, could we try to offer to the five district councils that before their council meeting, if they'd like to have a bit of training, 
you know, just so, as we do, you know, one of our great people <coughs> go in with the kids. It's a 15, 20 minute presentation. And I think for many counsellors, they would really appreciate and come away with a life skill. Yeah, that's fine. Can we, can we take that away then, please? Hang on, before you do, we shall have no public comment. Anti-argument. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I was going to suggest here yeah, was the, the potential, because a lot of the stuff we've done is in partnerships, so a lot of it's yeah. with the local authority, with, with the police, with, with the ambulance service. It may be that actually the, the you know, North West Ambulance Service may want to take up that opportunity yeah. to do that yeah. uh, on behalf of the, the, the collective. Uh, because I know they've been doing some extensive work around educating people in the use of defibrillators. So either North Sammon Service or ourselves will take up the uh, the government. Yeah. Okay. Me? Yeah, we should, yeah. As long as people remember that I did that stunt and slim. <laughs> Which I'm still not finished. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> but I have actually got over two hundred pounds of money that was collected and it's it's in, in the safe bill. But what I'd actually organised as well um, around the, in my ward, in the very old area, is that we're having um, a charity bingo to raise more money to it. So would you be able to do the training if we get that all sorted out? If, if you speak to me after the, the meeting or, or, yeah. or let me know some of the details, what I would, would take to do is between ourselves and the media ambulance service, we would love to be able to support the community. Or well, we we'll okay. yeah. 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 okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so is everyone happy? It's not officially part of the specific recommendation, but is everyone happy to leave it with the chief to take the whole issue away and then perhaps bring it back so we can try and drive forward? But I think I thank Leslie for raising the point about the training because when I personally wouldn't know what to do, so you're not the only one, Paul. There might be others, so. Okay? Yeah? I have been trained, but as Phil was saying, it's the confidence as well. Yeah. I yeah. think I would value a reflection. Right, okay. Okay, so are people happy to agree the recommendation on page 27? That's 2A, 2B? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Right, well, as I said before, I don't think there's any other items of other business other than to note the date of the next meeting provisionally <coughs> is the 3rd of September, but that's going to be agreed at the AGM on the 13th of June. So the only other thing I'd say now, I think I, think I am <coughs> right in saying, I know we've said goodbye and thank you to you before, uh, Sharon, but I think this is going to be your last... Yeah. formal meeting within yeah. the authority. Yeah. So I think I think we should all place on record our sincere yeah. thanks yeah. to Shannon for all the fantastic work she's done and wish her best of luck in the future. Thanks for okay. Okay. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief.